I'm Wendy Chamberlain from the uh, Middle East Institute, and uh, on behalf of the Middle East Institute and the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, um, we'd like to welcome all of you this morning to what uh, I know is going to be a very, very good discussion because I uh, have been friends with the three experts who are joining me on the panel and have a great deal of respect uh, for them. We're also very fortunate uh, to have planned this uh, this panel discussion at a time when I think so much is happening on this subject matter, and I'll reveal my own views. I think it's happening in a positive way, um, but uh, uh, we'll hear what the others say shortly. Uh, our keynote speaker, Mr. Heider Malik, is, uh, is uh, currently a fellow at the Joint Special Operations University and the Institute for Social Policy and Understanding. He's also affiliated with the University of Bradford's Pakistan Security Research Unit, and he has written a superb uh, monograph that you all can find on your chair there, and I really recommend it to you, Pakistan's Security Paradox, Counting and Fomenting Insurgencies. We uh, hope he'll discuss his findings of his recent trip to Pakistan, as well as his, his monograph. Um, he recently has returned from both Pakistan and India, uh, and he's been looking at ways to promote the partnership. Uh, he is joined on the panel by Ashley Tellis, who is also an expert on uh, U.S., Pakistan, and Indian relations. He's a senior associate of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. He specializes in international security, defense, and Asian strategic issues. He's written a number, many, many, many scholarly uh, works he served on the National Security Council uh, at uh, the White House uh, as a senior director for strategic planning for South Asia. Uh, I first met Ashley uh, when he served as special advisor uh, to uh, Ambassador Blackwell in New Delhi with distinction. Lisa Curtis is a senior research fellow at the Heritage Foundation. She also focuses on security and the political relationships with Pakistan, India, and Afghanistan. Uh, before joining Heritage uh, in 2006, um, Lisa worked on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. She served in U.S. embassies in Pakistan and India in the mid-90s and has taken part in uh, various official missions quite frequently to the region. She uh, has earned a well-earned meritorious honor award at the State Department for her work uh, on uh, the re securing the release of hostages in Kashmir, and I first met Lisa when she was serving as senior advisor in the South Asia Bureau uh, at the Department of State. She's published a number of op-ed pieces in the Washington Times and frequently appears, as do the other speakers, uh, uh, to, on CNN, CBS, Al Jazeera, et cetera, Fox News. Uh, I would like to welcome all three panelists and begin with Heider. Okay. Thank you. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here. Um, thank you, uh, uh, Middle East Institute. Thank you, Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, uh, for hosting me. Uh, without further ado, I'm going to dive in uh, because I have a lot of uh, a lot of topics to cover, but very very short time. So before I begin, I just want to say that I will be focusing on uh, Pakistan's counterinsurgency strategy. I'll talk in about three different phases very, very brief history, uh, talk about the time period between 2001 and 2008, uh, the turnaround in 2009, and then, of course, uh, some of the stabilization efforts that are ongoing this year, and then end with uh, some of the policy guidelines. Um, I will be intentionally skipping over some of the aspects, uh, uh, but I, I encourage you to bring them up during the Q&A. Uh, hopefully by the end of this uh, lecture, you will be able to create in your mind a framework to make sense of what is happening in Pakistan right now. Again, from a security perspective, that's the dead center, and everything else uh, obviously colors counterinsurgency uh, like domestic politics. But I would like uh, you to at least in the end have a framework where you can uh, make sense of what's going on. Uh, Counterinsurgency in Pakistan, in a very uh, broad sense, comes under 
uh, its national security strategy, uh, where uh, counterinsurgency has been primarily uh, something that's conducted inside the country. Now, uh, Pakistani counterinsurgents have advised other countries, uh, for example, Sri Lanka, uh, and then Pakistani counterinsurgents have been involved in peacekeeping missions in the UN. But counterinsurgency has been uh, a, a domestic issue, and it's mostly ag uh, against uh, successionist movements, autonomous movements like the Balochis, the Pashtuns, and then more recently, uh, uh, religious or ethno-religious. Uh, the idea actually goes back to 1947, um, and the problem is that there's this constant perpetual debate about how to keep the country together, uh, a common purpose, national cohesiveness, and different things have been tried. Um, and one thing that has had the, the worst effect on uh, across the board has been the misuse of the religion Islam to try to bring the country together because a very diverse country, different languages, different ethnicities. Um, and so that's something that, uh, that basically uh, is something that they discuss, uh, the counterinsurgents, uh, and then they go in and apply a strategy uh, based on uh, the successionist or autonomous movement. The idea, again, of Pakistan still remains an idea and that that still that uh, happens to be one of the major problems uh, in why people don't get along inside the country or regions or provinces or districts. Uh, the model, the approach has primarily been from 1947 to 2001 is out terrorize the terrorist. Uh, in other words, a very you know using brute force. And now that's kind of a blanket statement. Obviously, there have been times when the political reconciliation has been part of the menu of options and has been applied. Uh, one ca w there's only one insurgency that the Pakistani state lost, and that was East Pakistan, which became Bangladesh for a whole host of reasons, not just the counterinsurgency strategy that was being applied. Uh, lessons were learned uh, under pressure. They were then forgotten, and then uh, they were relearned. And you see some of the relearning happening uh, right now in Pakistan. Uh, one of the ideas that I came up with in my monograph Instead of looking at this notion of the uh, Pakistani state supporting proxies or militant groups or terrorist organizations as some kind of a tactical advantage, I wanted to look at it more in a more strategic way, and that's, uh, that's where the discussion changed. The original monograph was supposed to be short. I went to Pakistan with these typical preconceived notions uh, it, that we have in the think tank world where the Pakistanis were supporting certain uh, elements, uh, insurgents, and, and of course, uh, going after the others, but not going after the insurgents that we would like them to go. And that's where I, I talked to a senior ISI official, and he says, in the 1960s and 70s, when I was going to school, and we were uh, studying insurgency and Mao, uh, our professor said, don't just study how to effectively counter insurgency, but also how to foment one. And that really was the game changer for me. And I said, okay, this can't just be a tactic. This is bigger uh, than that. This is an actual strategy. And it's, it's a strategy that the Pakistanis perfected during the 1980s when they supported with the help of the CIA and then was applied in Kashmir. And also in the 80s, it was applied in uh, Indian Punjab. Why would a country do that? Again, this is a very cursory look, I hope, to follow this very carefully and write an entire monograph on Justin Foyne um, was the idea of plausible deniability, which became even more important after Pakistan became a nuclear power. Um, it, it was cheap, it was effective, uh, it was a force multiplier. You, at one point, uh, there were 450,000 Indian troops pointing their guns at Kashmiri insurgents and not at the Pakistani state. But it was also short-lived, and it had a lot of weaknesses, and there was a major blowback later on we, that I will discuss. And how they actually uh, created uh, a foin or foment in insurgency was in a very, very sophisticated way. The image that you get in Washington is a couple of rogue ISI agents with, with beards and helping uh, a small group somewhere in the corner uh, putting down $500. Well, that's, that was part of it. It was a very small part of it. But on a grand strategy perspective, we're talking about principles meetings. We're talking about um, the intelligence agency, really, 
uh, coming up in the front and saying uh, we need to implement FOIN and these are the reasons and we need that strategic advantage because that's how we define national security. And in Afghanistan, in many ways, it was justified. Uh, it, it may, we can argue about how justified it was in uh, India. But the idea that you could control these elements uh, was very misleading, and uh, that was basically uh, why it s now you see foreign phasing out. The main, uh, going to the, the, the second part of the presentation, which is basically talking about this coin foreign paradox. And I'm not going to bore you, people who have come here have a fairly good idea about the, the narrative, and it goes like this. From 2001 to 2008, Pakistanis were, uh, went after uh, Al-Qaeda and uh, Pakistani Taliban, which came into creation about 2006, 2007, selectively, but they did go after them. But in many ways, they were indirectly supporting the Afghan Taliban as a hedging policy against Indian influence in Afghanistan. That's the narrative. Uh, in many ways, this was true. And over the years, after 2000, you know, 2009, 2010, uh, we see uh, a lot of that coming out in the open. And the reason was because Pakistanis felt that they were that the only way they could influence uh, Afghanistan and make, make sure that their western border uh, was safe uh, under uh, the strategy of uh, strategic depth, which I believe is kind of a subset of strategic spread. And if you want to know what that boring word <laughs> means, you can read it in the monograph. But the idea was that this is the only way we could make a difference. We could turn things around in Afghanistan because we, were, we had perfected foreign, that it was, again, cheap, because India was willing to put uh, several uh, millions of dollars into uh, development projects. Pakistanis uh, either chose not to or, frankly, just couldn't because they just didn't have the resources. Uh, this eventually starts to phase out by the end of 2008, uh, and, and there are about three different reasons. One is that uh, it gets exposed. Uh, the American intelligence is not stupid. They, uh, during this time, many peace deals were signed and cross-border attacks increased. Uh, Al-Qaeda got weaker, uh, but Pakistani Taliban got stronger, which had strong ties with Afghan Taliban, more IED attacks, more suicide attacks, more training centers. Uh, so all of that happening. And, and in fact, by early 2009, 80% of Pakistani North is under Taliban effective control. And then so it gets out of hand, and then there's obviously the blowback. Thousands of uh, innocent civilians in Pakistan dead becomes, Pakistan becomes uh, the biggest victim of terrorism. Um, and uh, so it, the policy gets exposed, Pakistan get, uh, becomes a victim. Uh, and there's, there's thinking uh, on the higher ups in the Pakistani GHQ, the Pakistani Pentagon, and uh, in Islamabad that they need to make the counter, they have to go after the Pakistani Taliban now because they're completely out of control. And they're, they're not the only ones, obviously. There are other groups uh, like Lashkar e Taiba or Haqqani Network, but I'm focusing on Pakistani Taliban because that was one group that was really isolated in this and, serious, uh, and was the most powerful one in early 2009. Um, and that the thinking was okay, we, we've done this coin foreign paradox, it's not working. We need to make COIN more effective and perhaps move some of these resources and try to look in the future 10, 15 years from now when tolerance for this kind of foreign will no longer exist in the region or internationally. And frankly, these kind of elements just cannot be controlled. Looking forward 15, 20 years, uh, a, a strategic move was made to invest more in nuclear weapons and make COIN more effective. Now, that's easily said than done. So that's the, the top-down approach that starts in 2009. That's where this paradigm shift happens. Uh, and while I, I think that it's very fragile, it's easily reversible, I and mean, you can debate about how much change this has actually brought up in the ground, I cannot deny the fact that a, a group like Pakistani Taliban that control 80% of the North now only controls about 10 to 20% effectively. And that uh, the popular support for the, this kind of military operation was about 10%, and now it's about 80%. So, so something changed, and uh, I wanted to know what it was. It changed not because of uh, this notion of classic counterinsurgency that, that somehow ethically or morally you have to protect the people, and the people will then produce better intelligence, but mostly because the Pakistani army was paranoid about troop morale. 
Now you have to remember this is a time when there's really 10% support for any kind of military operation. Uh, when troops come home, uh, a lot of their neighbors don't talk to them. They're confused. There's mission ambiguity. Nobody really knows. I met majors and colonels who would go into battle uh, for 24 hours straight. And the next day, their senior commander would say, oh, we're going to the Jirga, this community, uh, this uh, gathering of tribal Maliks, and we will be shaking hands with, with the enemy that you were uh, trying to kill last night. And by the way, after we've cleared this area, we're going to pack up and leave. We're not staying here. This is a different kind of a culture, and, and frankly, we're just not interested in holding territory. But we are interested in kind of clearing it when it reaches a certain level. And I already mentioned that Foyne was backfiring. Obviously, the groups that were uh, previously assets were now becoming enemies of the state. Another thing happened from a military... So troop morale is very low, and ISI, uh, probably one of the most powerful uh, intelligence agencies in the world, and no doubt uh, an expert in Foyne, lost this intelligence network, uh, close to, I think, 60... Uh, assets and uh, mid-level officers were killed. You kept, you kept hearing these stories, Taliban have assassinated an uh, ISI spy. So there's no intelligence. They don't know, so they're shooting in the dark. They don't know how long they're allowed to shoot the enemy, and they don't know if the enemy is going to be a friend tomorrow or not. And this is, this is terrible for a force where you see some of the paramilitary uh, 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 soldiers deserting. So this is, this is something that from the top level where General Kiani, General Pasha, uh, General Tariq Khan realize and they say we need to come up with a new strategy. It's also bottom up. I mean, these lieutenant colonels and majors eventually start coming to General Tariq Khan late 2008 in Bajor, uh, where the actual Bajor experiment of the turnaround actually starts, where they say, okay, we need to perhaps protect the population, not because it's the right thing, but because if we protect them, we have a better chance of getting good intelligence. If we get good intelligence, that's better targeting. Better targeting means that we'll be able to kill something, come back and say we killed the enemy, uh, and that eventually that will feed into uh, popular support. So they kind of created a hybrid, uh, enemy and morale-centric kind of a hybrid. So it's not, it's not as easy as moving from a spectrum of enemy-centric, brute force, Roman model, search and destroy, to this really nice, um, winning hearts and minds. It's something very in the middle, it's an indigenous mix. And uh, it started to work. And you see a little bit of this positive cycle that built up. Uh, population was secured, better intel, targeting troop morale, better cooperation. United States played a very, very important role. Uh, we know about the resources it put in, financial resources. We know a little bit about the training program. Uh, but what I want to share now is something that uh, I just found out recently. And it's something, uh, it's been, a, in many ways, I don't know why it's been a secret, uh, but it's a, it's a great success story of American training program that was geared towards the Frontier Corps that started late 2007, and then a special uh, program, training program that started in 2008. And while we know about the tactical training, you know, here's the weapon, this is how you use it, so the strategic training part was the really cool part that I found out, which was basically how to uh, create and manage and implement a counterinsurgency campaign that includes population security. And from that kind of a general thing, you see a lot of these younger officers coming in and joining General Tariq Khan in, in um, Bajor, and then more of them coming into the Swat Valley when that operation started to really reverse Taliban gains there. Um, and so it had to be effective clearing, and I'll talk a little bit about what they did with the temporary population resettlement program because collateral damage has been really the big thorning issue in the, when you have a brute force centric kind of a, a policy a lot of a lot of innocent civilians die if they die they don't tell you with well, who the bad guy is if they don't tell you you don't know who you're killing and eventually uh, your troops uh, face uh, morale problems uh, which can be very very dangerous again very briefly uh, <laughs> the approach, the strategy, the operations, and tactics. Uh, and I can go into some of these details during Q&A of exactly what happened. But that, that was basically the turnaround. Now, 2009 was, again, uh, uh, with all the good news, was still very military-focused, and was still very focused on the first stage of counterinsurgency, which is clearing. And a little bit of holding started. And basically, three areas are we looking at. We're looking at Bajor, 
inside the federal, uh, federally administered tribal areas. Then we're looking at Swat Valley and its Enveron, Shangla, Bonaire, uh, and then we're looking at South Waziristan. And you see this turn uh, happening, and uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of things started changing on the ground, and Balaban are being pushed back. I wanted to share this map. Uh, you can see that I've done this. So it's not very professional, but it gives you a very good idea of where we were and where we are now. Where we were and where we are now. Now, obviously, there are certain things missing here, southern Punjab, uh, but I do mention Karachi, and we can talk about that. But again, focused on the Pakistani Taliban and some of their really close allies in, in the north uh, and in northern Balochistan. And you see this shift happening. Now, it's very vital that they maintain these gains, and that's why I will talk in 2010 is the year of holding. So they were able to clear many of these areas in Pakistan in 2009. This year is all about holding. And this is the plan that they have. And the person in charge is General Nadeem Ahmed, who is in charge of a special support group, reports to General Kiani and the Prime Minister. And there are about three really interesting, innovative initiatives uh, that they have introduced. And some of them carry promise, uh, and others need to be modified so that uh, U.S. security interests can also uh, be achieved while Pakistan achieves its own. Resettlement, we've heard a lot about IDPs, we've heard uh, over the years, and, and while all of that was important, I wanted to put it into a framework that made sense, and I realized that uh, it started with people just running off, you know, in, the, in 2004, 2005, where the army would go in and people would run off and they would get some relief, and then in those relief you know, that relief turned into little camps. And then over time, you, you saw a more concerted effort, more USAID going in and weatherproof uh, 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 camps. And then those camps started to have clinics and uh, vocational training centers. And this was bigger than just people moving out for a short period of time. And I realized in my research is that uh, they had, the, the Pakistani planners had studied the past and they realized that some things work in this kind of resettlement. Resettlement is an old tactic used in counterinsurgency. Uh, the British used it effectively in Malaya. The Americans uh, did not in Vietnam. Uh, and so they realized, okay, the first thing, it has to be voluntary, and I don't, you know, that's a question mark. If your house is being bombed, you have to go. But let's just say, it, you know, for, for, for the debate purpose, voluntary, and then temporary, so that, that and there's a promise of a better post-conflict life. So you're being trained. I mean, some of the training center, frankly, were just construction. So guys were being taught, if you go back and your business building doesn't look the same, at least you'll know how to put it back. In, uh, and and your, if your house, your ceiling is leaking, you know, you can do these things. And provided shelter and clinics. The second, uh, and this resettlement kind of starts before cleaning operations and stays throughout the counterinsurgency campaign. That's also very important to note. And they've had significant success. Uh, and I'll talk about that. Reconstruction is the second part where I will talk a little bit about the Pakistani version of a pr uh, provincial reconstruction team, district reconstruction team, and how they're working on getting the economic infrastructure back, building some schools, and really trying to uh, get the basic administ administration back. And obviously I'm talking about the Swat Valley area right now because that's the one that we can really have a good idea about. South Waziristan is too... Uh, uh, it's too early to, to really gauge what, what is going to happen, but we do know what they're about to apply there as, as their holding plan. And then Pakistani version of the Taliban reintegration plan is also very, very important. Just because they haven't talked to the Taliban for, for a, a while, uh, obviously they had some understanding with local commanders when they went to South Waziristan, but generally speaking, a military that used to jump on the first opportunity to talk has actually stayed away from that and has gained the initiative against the Pakistani Taliban and can now is in a, uh, can truly negotiate from a position of strength. Americans, to their credit, people like General Petraeus from Central Command, uh, Secretary Clinton from the State Department, has really pushed for a regional reintegration plan and have invited the Pakistanis into that. And in exchange for that, they have uh, promised uh, you know, a reasonable level of support uh, with trying to solve the India-Pakistan 
uh, off again, on again crisis. Uh, while Kashmir is not the focus of that, it starts with Kabul, but it can certainly lead to uh, Kashmir. At least that's what the Pakistanis believe the Americans can do. Um, so real, real fast, uh, again, about 1.8 million people were displaced and about 2 million were back. Um, about 1.8, sorry, 1.8 were back, 2 million uh, were displaced. And this all happened in a couple of months. And there was a reason, you know, I just explained the whole thing of how they, they planned this. This was a gamble. Like I said, it starts mostly by, not by design, but by accident. And it starts at a very raw kind of level, and it builds up. And when it works in SWAT, um, the Pakistani military is very confident, and they apply a similar model in South Waziristan. And you see some of the data that's coming out. Now, not all these camps, uh, you know, these camps are not like the homes the people have left behind. There are a lot of problems. They are under-resourced. But this is uh, a, a strategy on balance that is working. And the same people that were able to go back to SWAT have provided excellent intelligence. Now, there will always be sp sporadic attacks in these areas, but you see a dramatic decrease in the kind of attacks that you would see in SWAT in South Waziristan area or even in Bajor. Um, and, and that's because of these initiatives they were able to implement. This is basically a general, you know, what exactly is a PRT or DRT, you know, kind of the U.S. version. Um, and then you have the Pakistani version. And then they're struggling. There's a lot of interagency disconnect, lack of resources, red tape, not knowing where to go. For example, you start out with the Pakistani Army Special Group, then you have the Provincial Relief, Reconstruction, Resettlement Authorities, then you have the administration, the DCOs, and you have the, the local uh, army commanders. You have intelligence operations. You need to uh, get the power grid back online. You have to have water. Uh, Sanitation, but they're struggling. And one of the one of the things that I was able to notice in the Swat Valley was the great work that the DCO there is doing. Uh, and even while they have they don't have the kind of resources they would want, they're struggling and moving forward. And they realize 2010 is going to be the area the year where they're really going to do holding operations for the first time. And frankly, for the first time in a very very long time. And in this and they've never done it in this very unique way. The integration plan, the stages of the Pakistani reintegration plan are also very important. Um, this is obviously the, the you know, Pakistani version of the plan if everything goes well and, and India and, and Washington uh, agree to sign up on that. And I think the, the understanding is that you will go with somebody very moderate like Gulbuddin Hikmatyar that everybody can, can live with uh, even uh, as compared to Mullah Umar or the Haqqanis. Uh, and then move from that, those talks, to some kind of a settlement, regional settlement, some kind of influence sharing between India and Pakistan inside Afghanistan, where both countries feel safe and they feel that they can live with a post-U.S. troop Afghanistan. And that's something that they're working on as we speak. And then I think Haqqani, Mullah Omar come in. The, the recent arrests of the six Taliban uh, uh, commanders should be taken in this context. And that's why I said I'm trying to provide you a framework to make some of these things make sense. And then I think the future is, of course, regional cooperation. It is trade. It is lessons learned and then shared on both sides. And then finally, a long-term plan to disengage from Afghanistan. And I think Pakistanis and, and Indians will both agree that that would be the key. But as of now, I think both both countries feel that Afghanistan has to almost earn its sovereignty, it has to earn uh, a credibility so that it can, can, can uh, secure its entire territory. Major caveats, I've already kind of alluded to them, lack of holding capabilities. Here you'll see, uh, in, in addition to all the, the initiative they have into, you know, great on paper, not so much uh, in action and you do need more resources. Um, but you need resources, uh, if they're coming from the United States, they need to be done in a more transparent way, and then it has to, uh, the, the war of perceptions has to be factored in. It's very important to um, help the Pakistanis hold territory, but do it in a way where, where it's not like the past, where, every, where U.S. support is, is completely kind of in the back burner and, and, and there's no branding of the U.S. Here, you have to kind of start a very, very difficult uh, uh, strategy uh, or a difficult path to eventually sell uh, U.S. aid and U.S. Um, 
help to the people of Pakistan, which is very, very important. Just because uh, we have moved from a one-man show, i.e. General Pervez Musharraf, to uh, you know, a crowd of people, we still need to go further. We need to go and talk to the Pakistani uh, people, the civil society and groups like that, and, give them, and, and find interesting ways uh, of getting them on board. You have recovery.gov here. You should have something like USAID for me dot com where people can go, they can see this is Carrie Luger, this is the money that's coming in, these are the kind of schools that are being built. Track it in real time, make it transparent, countable. There, there are problems with an agency I talked about. And then, frankly, insurgents are opening multiple fronts. And that kind of brings me to areas that I would have loved to, uh, to um, cover, but I have limited time. And that's, of course, southern Punjab, Balochistan, and lower Sindh. So it's very important to look at all of this and also not to discount the Taliban. We have somehow, just because we have moved from the paradigm of two countries with two armies, uh, to a country and this vague, crazy, irregular warrior, uh, we, have, we all automatically assume that Taliban don't have a strategy, they don't have a doctrine, they don't sit down, they don't analyze, they don't debate, they don't have the kind of um, uh, healthy uh, talk about strategy. That, uh, and we, we, we should change that mindset and look at them uh, as an enemy that is extremely uh, adept and uh, smart and does all of that. Um, the, the differences in U.S. perception, just because of 2009, Pakistanis went after Pakistani Taliban, no doubt they're attached to Afghan Taliban, and now they're going after Afghan Taliban. But there are other groups. The Haqqani Network is still out there. The lashkar e taiba is still out there. Now, I can understand when the Pakistanis say we only have a few sticks and we can't, to, to, uh, to quote uh, General Petraeus, who's there and only 12 hours ago, uh, said that you know, he believes that it's very difficult when, when, he, when, when he agrees with General Kiani when he says, I have limited stakes and too many hornet's nests. And that's exactly what we see. But that doesn't discount the fact that lashkar e taiba has not been touched for a very long time. And the Haqqani network somehow has to be put into uh, this uh, grand strategy to move forward. So where they were, basically where the Pakistanis were, uh, very, very counterproductive brute force. And they were abetting most insurgents and most of the bad guys that we consider bad guys. You, you see 2009, early 2010, really effective clearing. They're able to stabilize. They have the intention to. They've come out with internet ways, and they've tried to change uh, the strategy on the top. Now, even though there are major problems in actually implementing that, uh, and now they still abet certain insurgents, but the list has certainly become very short. Where we would like them to go, obviously, is to secure and govern their own country. I mean, that's the bottom line be able to uh, make sure that no terrorist organization is using it as a sanctuary. And finally, to go after all the insurgents, to, be in, to have the capability to go after all of them. Uh, I don't like getting into debates of will, uh, you know, did they have the will or not. Uh, I leave that to the journalists. But as a strategist, I think you have to focus on the, the rational model most of the time. And, that, and what I've tried to present is this is what Ba Pakistan feels where it is and how uh, it believes it can go forward and, and some of the gains it achieved in 2009 inside the country and the kind of positive effect it's had in uh, dealing with Afghanistan and the new role that Pakistan finds itself in uh, as Washington tries to put some pressure on Delhi for uh, negotiations and even Delhi saying, okay, there are certain Taliban that we uh, could talk to and the, the reintegration plan truly becoming regional. So very briefly, um, the regional approach is excellent. It needs to be sustained. And by that, I put everything in the ambit, you know, the development component, the diplomatic component, the security component. Change Pakistani perceptions. And it's not just threat perception, which I think Washington's done a great job, you know, af by putting this pressure, but also perceptions of ordinary Pakistanis. Because if you continue to lose the war of perceptions, you eventually lose the war of action. If you, every time I go back and I see another barrier outside the US embassy, eventually I won't be able to see it. Mm -hmm. And that's a problem. And they need to be out there in the field. But they, if they get out, they're killed. So you have to find somewhere in the middle of getting, them out, getting aid workers out there and really uh, building a true partnership and being proud of it almost, uh, rather than kind of hiding it. And I can understand the obvious reasons. But you know, here we are, it's 2010. 
it's time to reevaluate. I could buy the old argument of protecting US aid workers and somehow giving legitimacy to the local government by saying, this is your money, and tell, you know, when you spend it, tell the Pakistanis it's your money, it's the government's money, not, not coming from the United States. Well, I think now it's very different, and uh, we need to reevaluate. And then, most importantly, the lessons from Pakistan need to be put into a, a process that it can, be, it can be shared across the border, and frankly, with, with CENTCOM and the American military. The, these, are, these are excellent lessons to be learned. They can be applied in the future. There's a lot of relevance to these lessons learned in the clearing operations stabilization. Uh, Pakistan needs to broaden its national security, and you see all of that happening now. I think even people who sit down, um, I think tomorrow, or have already sat down today in Delhi, are looking at uh, the Kashmir problem, for example, in, in, uh, from a lens of the Musharraf model, which itself is, is very dramatic. So that if you use the Musharraf model as a baseline, where you're willing to uh, give up some of the old stand of, of uh, uh, complete autonomy to some kind of shared autonomy, this complex, that's good, and that needs to continue, and that needs to be reflected in Afghanistan. Um, obviously, confronting Taliban allies and eventually going after the Haqqanis and LET is something that we would love for them to do. After uh, holding the area effectively, start building it. Uh, build it in a way that these guys don't come back. And that doesn't just mean governance and administration and development and roads, but also means uh, coats that work, justice that is to some extent speedy. And then find a new common purpose. <clears throat> find a way of getting, uh, again, these are general things, and the reason I do that is because I wanted to cover a lot. Now I can obviously go into specifics. But the new common purpose is basically a new debate of how we can get together. We don't have to exploit a religion to be together, we could be together for other reasons. And what are those reasons? Obviously, the Pakistanis have to decide, but they need to change. Uh, and that is, that's a wrap. <clears throat> well, thank you very much. You have indeed, uh, <clears throat> you have indeed covered a great deal, and we have a lot to talk about. Lisa? Okay, thank you very much to the Carnegie Endowment and the Middle East Institute for inviting me here today to comment on Haider's very uh, comprehensive and extensive monograph. Uh, I think it's going to be very useful for uh, U.S. policymakers, people seeking to understand Pakistan's strategy uh, in the history of what we've seen. So much has happened in Pakistan over the last um, eight, nine years. And I think he has provided a, a great background, particularly on the how some of the um, some of Pakistan's past mistakes with counterinsurgency, and illuminating the impact of the numerous peace deals. He talks about the first peace deal in March 2004, the Shakai peace deal, which um, he indicates was interpreted by the locals as a military surrender. Obviously, not helpful for Pakistan's overall strategy. He talks about the February 2005 peace agreement with Beitullah Massoud, which also turned out to be a disaster, um, emboldening Beitullah Massoud uh, to develop or you know form the Tariqi Taliban Pakistan in 2007, then of course to assassinate Benazir Bhutto later that same year, uh, and then going on to direct a string of suicide attacks against both Pakistani security forces and civilians. So I think it is useful to, to go back over the history, but then he, he rightly makes the case that the Pakistan military has started to learn from these mistakes um, and indicates the major turning point in 2008 when the Bajor and Mamand uh, operations were launched. Uh, he correctly argues that the breakdown of the Malakand Accord in April 2009 was a very significant turning point for the Pakistan military. And after the breakdown of that agreement, of course, we had the military finally go in, clear out the Taliban forces from the Swat Valley. Um, and I, I, he, he didn't talk a lot about his phrase, strategic spread, but I would encourage people to look at the, it's on page 17, because I, I think it is enlightening and it helps you understand the strategy that he's describing. So let me just briefly uh, say what that is. Uh, he describes strategic spread as national defense strategy of protecting military and nuclear parity against Indian encirclement, quelling internal dissent, 
strengthening religious cohesiveness, and making foreign aid plentiful and certain. And then he has a, a table on page 18, which I would argue shows a very militaristic foreign policy that relies solely on force uh, to carry out Pakistan's national security objectives. Coin, on the one hand, as he's pointed out, uh, for internal defense, and foin, um, it's actually a useful phrase, uh, or fomenting insurgency for external defense. But there's absolutely no mention of diplomatic strategy or investment in the economy or human capital as a way to enhance national security. So I just point that out because I think that's, that's enlightening if you're looking at the, the strategy here. Um, now, where I started to have some questions about the report was starting in Chapter 3, which is titled The coin Foin Paradox. Paradox. And what troubled me, I think, was the juxtaposition of these two phrases as if the two strategies are morally equivalent or equally acceptable in the eyes of the international community. And I certainly don't think that's the case. I think there could have been more attention given to the cost of the foreign strategy, both to the Pakistani people and the international community. For instance, over 3,000 Pakistanis were killed last year alone, and the number of U.S. soldiers that have died in Afghanistan uh, has nearly crossed the 1,000 mark, as we saw on the front page of the Washington Post today. And these are both in part because of Pakistan's foreign strategy. And I think on page 35, there is a passage that illuminates the inherent contradictions and dangerous consequences for Pakistan and the international community of this coin foin strategy. And I'm, I'm going to point to a recent statement by a, uh, Pakistan's former information minister, Sherry Rukman, who's now a uh, parliamentarian. And she recently told Parliament, um, she was commenting about the ability of Hafez Muhammad Saeed, the leader of the Jamal al Dawa, which is the front organization for the Lashkar Taiba, uh, to be able to hold a public rally calling for attacks against India on February 5th. And what she said, this, these are her words, it is shocking to see how a banned terrorist organization is allowed to challenge the writ of the state. What is the point of our innocent civilians and soldiers dying in a borderless war against such terrorists when armed banned outfits can hold the whole nation hostage in the heart of Punjab's provincial capital? So I think the point here is that allowing some militant groups to operate provides a conducive environment for all militants, and it undermines the ability of the government to maintain law and order. So I thought the report might have spelled that out um, a bit more clearly or gone into more depth on that. <clears throat> Another question I have is, um, if this is a minor point, but I'll, I'll just make it, the relationship between the Afghan Taliban and al-Qaeda. I think on, on one page, on page 63, the report says the Afghan Taliban are major partners of al-Qaeda. But earlier in the report, it leaves out the Afghan Taliban when it lists uh, the groups of militants that are in association with al-Qaeda. I think it refers to it as AQA or al-Qaeda associates. Um, so I, th I think you know, we, this is an issue we have to look at. And you know, the, the monograph makes the assertion that um, you know, the Afghan Taliban will someday impose on the Pakistani Taliban to stop attacking the Pakistani military, or at least that's what some military strategists believe. But I think it begs the question, under what circumstances would they be motivated to do that? Because um, the monograph rightly says that the common goals of AQA, or al-Qaeda associates, are stronger than their divergent goals. And I think this is the key point that, that needs to be uh, repeated, and I think Secretary of Defense Gates uh, sought to do that in the recent op-ed that he wrote. Now, the report also raises some questions about the U.S.-Pakistan relationship and the nature of those interactions. Um, on page 62, um, let me just quickly refer to that. I think the language is important. So, um, asserts this monograph questions existing policy assumptions, and the first one being Pakistan's foreign policy makes it a suspect partner and not a vital resource to dismantle insurgencies in the region. But I would, I would ask, you know, what is in there to debunk that? You know, or I, I mean, I think, you know, he's made the case that um, the situation is turning around. The military has gone into Swat Valley. It's gone into South Waziristan. Now we have the recent capture of the Afghan Taliban leadership. 
So, you know, we, we do have some points to, to build on. But um, I would say, it, it, you know, I, I didn't think that that, that, that idea is not fully debunked in my mind. And so I, I just raised that point. Um, <clears throat> so I think overall, just to recap, the report highlights that Pakistan has been willing to employ an incredibly risky strategy that has directly undermined the U.S. NATO mission in Afghanistan. That's undeniable. Uh, the report, you know, kind of hints or leads us to believe that Pakistan is ready to change its strategy. Um, and certainly, you know, events over the last week would also point in that direction. Uh, but I do think it is early to say whether uh, the recent arrests of the Afghan Taliban leaders reflects a broader change in Pakistani strategy. Um, you know, it still could be a, a tactical move along the lines of, of uh, developments we've seen in the past. We've seen, you know, certain leaders are picked up, but yet there's not a, a full attention to reining in all the militants. Um, so, you know, the question in my mind is, um, is, are the recent arrests more about gaining strategic advantage over India, perhaps in the run-up to tomorrow's talks, or do they reflect a genuine interest in, in genuinely cooperating with the U.S. in promoting stability in Afghanistan? And I would say the jury is still out on that. I'm not a pessimist, but I'm a skeptic. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jason. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Wendy. It's a pleasure to be here this morning and to comment on Haider Malik's monograph, which I actually commend to you, uh, first because of its scholarship. It's the first piece of work that looks very closely at Pakistan's counterinsurgency experience and does a remarkable job of addressing the dilemmas and the challenges that Pakistan has faced over the last decade. I want to also congratulate him for taking on a subject that is acutely sensitive at a political level. As Lisa has pointed out, Pakistan has pursued for now close to 30 years a very provocative and sometimes dangerous strategy. Dangerous to the international community, dangerous to its neighbors, but above all, dangerous to itself. And to be able to confront that strategy uh, in an unbiased fashion, uh, analytically, is really a challenge. And I think Haider has done a remarkable job of laying out uh, not only the content of the strategy, but the calculations that have led up to it. And I share Lisa's judgment completely that I wish he had spent a little more time assessing the consequences, but you know, he's a young man and this is his first major work, so we have great expectations <laughs> there is, that there is much more to come. I'm going to address uh, the monograph in the form of making propositions about three, three baskets of issues that I think uh, the, uh, the discussion raised. The first basket has to do with the level of grand strategy. And here I would make the point that although Haider treats uh, counterinsurgency and fomenting insurgency as symmetrical, they have not been symmetrical in Pakistan's application of policy. The weight assigned to fomenting insurgencies versus countering insurgencies has really varied over a period of time. And it's varied both as a function of opportunities and circumstance. The tragedy is that Pakistan has disproportionately invested in fomenting insurgencies for the greater part of the 30-year period that is under review. And only in the last decade has been compelled to think seriously about the challenges of countering these insurgencies. Pakistan has been uh, the first object at the consequences of that strategy, and that is something that we've obviously uh, flagged this morning. I also want to make a second point in this regard. One needs to be careful with respect to the concept of fomenting insurgencies, because I think there have been two constituent elements in the strategy. Fomenting insurgencies essentially presumes 
that there is a disaffected group on the territory of another state which can be supported in the context of its own native dissatisfactions vis-a-vis -vis the state it opposes. Pakistan has certainly done this. But there is another element of its strategy which I think can only be crudely and brutally summarized as fomenting terrorism, where it is the support of groups that have engaged in armed activities against another state without any connection to the complaints of disadvantaged groups within that country. And particularly in the late 1990s onwards, the efforts that the Pakistani state made in supporting groups that, were in, that are involved, that to this day are still involved, in straightforward terrorist activities, which have nothing to do with domestic grievances in other states, I think needs to be flagged as really something that is quite distinctive and cannot be simply uh, summed under the rubric of, of fomenting insurgencies. The third point I want to make at the level of grand strategy is that when one talks about the question of countering insurgencies, to this day, Pakistan's efforts, while certainly changing for the better, and that is uh, certainly a dynamic we don't want to overlook, still remains in very vital respects selective, and its selectivity is driven by the utility of counterinsurgency to what are overriding national interests. And Haider flags that when he talks of an uber grand strategy which drives Pakistan to foment insurgencies. And so when one thinks of counterinsurgency and the changes that are taking place in Pakistan's counterinsurgency performance, I think it's very important to keep in mind that the investments made in countering insurgencies are driven by a very utilitarian calculus about the value of countering some insurgencies which have become troubling to the Pakistani state. And this raises what I see as really the fundamental question that comes out of his monograph. That is when one talks of a paradigm shift in Pakistan's strategy, or potentially a paradigm shift, are we really talking of something that is truly a paradigm shift, which is a complete inversion of a pre-existing model? Or are we really talking of a selective refinement of a pre-existing model to address what have become some negative externalities or some encumbrances that have, that have arisen from the application of that model. I mean, this is really, I think, the heart of the debate about Pakistan's uh, counterinsurgency performance. My own view, and Haider admits this in the last section of the monograph, that there are still major groups out there, both insurgent groups and terrorist groups, that have not yet been at the receiving end of the Pakistani state's attentions. Uh, lashkar e taiba is one, jaish e mohammed is another, the Haqqani Network is a third, and above all, particularly from the perspective of American interests, the Afghan Taliban and its leadership, which, depending on whom you believe, uh, exists in some part of either the Pakistani frontier or perhaps even deeper in Pakistan. These groups have so far escaped Pakistani state attention. And therefore the question of what one means when one asserts that there is a paradigm shift really is something that ought to be uh, the subject of debate. So much for the question of grand strategy. Let me say something about, uh, on, in the second basket, about the issue of the application of Pakistan's counterinsurgency strategy in op at an operational level. I think Haider has done a remarkable job in describing what is distinctive about Pakistan's counterinsurgency strategies at an operational level. And the first thing to keep in mind, and it actually strikes you in the way he describes it in the monograph, is that this is not a counterinsurgency campaign that is aimed at replicating what in the West is conventionally called winning hearts and minds. 
it is something quite different. And in fact, it, it's more accurately described as a strategy that aims to crush the bones of these terrorist groups. Because that is perhaps the only thing that the Pakistani state can do, given its history, given its resource limitations, and given its capacity limitations, with doing counterinsurgency of the kind that the US, for example, is trying to do today in Afghanistan. There are very serious limitations to Pakistan's counterinsurgency capability, which simply cannot be wished away. And there is a tradition of the Pakistan army professionally preparing over a 60-year period for essentially one military campaign, and that is a conventional military campaign against a conventionally armed adversary. And so the counterinsurgency campaign that you see being conducted today really is an attempt to apply the tenets of conventional warfare against an unconventional adversary. And that is really what is distinctive about Pakistan's operational art with respect to counterinsurgency. So when one thinks of the Western model as essentially a model that is now summarized by this trifecta of clear, hold, and build, with the emphasis on clearing terrorist groups from a given area, holding that area, and then building in it, in the Pakistani case, the idea has been somewhat different. And the idea, I think, is best described through the trifecta of clear, interdict, and reclaim. The emphasis on clearing is not so much clearing the terrorists from a certain spatial domain, but rather clearing the population from a certain spatial domain in order to isolate the terrorists who can then be interdicted through the use of conventional military force. And once that interdiction campaign is brought to a successful conclusion, then reclaiming the territory and ending up with resettlement. Now, there are reasons why the Pakistanis have moved in this route. And to my mind, the two most important reasons are that all militaries do what is first and foremost within their capacity to do. That is, you can bring the manuals from anywhere else in the world and tell them that this is how it is supposed to be done in principle. But if by training, if by history, if by predisposition, you're incapable of doing it, you're simply going to do it the way you know best. The second element is simply the fact that in the areas where the Pakistani state is conducting counterinsurgency operations today, the most distinctive element of that campaign has been the absence of state presence for close to 100 years. So the idea that you can expect the Pakistani state to do clear hold and build in the way that the United States attempted to do in Iraq and is now trying to do in Afghanistan in an area where the state has essentially been absent is perhaps asking too much. But there is a very big downside. And the very big downside at the level of operational art for Pakistan is the very high human cost that comes through its counterinsurgency strategy. It is a very high human cost in terms of displacements of peoples, <clears throat> in terms of collateral damage to physical assets, and then the costs that the state has to bear for rebuilding and resettlement. Not to mention all the psychological costs which come, which having to rebuild a trust with a population that for all practical purposes has been at the receiving end of what is a very high intensity, attrition driven military operation. Let me make the third and last point which is asking ourselves where we go from here. My own view is that the future of Pakistan's coin-foin dichotomy that Haider very clearly amplifies in his monograph, the future of the strategy is still uncertain. Like Lisa, I'm not yet ready to uncork the champagne and declare that Pakistan has turned a corner with respect to its strategy. Because there is still considerable evidence out there that makes the case for hesitation and unwillingness. Now, there may be good reasons 
for this, for this hesitation and unwillingness. And I think the task for policymakers in Pakistan, in the United States, and in the region is to plumb more carefully what the reasons for this hesitation and unwillingness might be. But the fact that there is still hesitation and unwillingness, I think, cannot be wished away. Which leads me to the point that the question of whether Pakistan can sustain this current strategy of, in a sense, running with the hares and hunting with the hounds can be sustained indefinitely to Pakistan's own advantage really remains a question that has to be asked. As we have pointed out in this discussion, there are still groups out there that pose serious threats to the international community. But above all else, to the Pakistani state. Above all else, to the Pakistani state. And I discern that there is still considerable degrees of conflictedness in the military leadership in Pakistan with respect to whether Pakistan can afford to go after all these insurgent and opposition groups uniformly. Because there is still this residual hope that at least some of these groups may still have some lasting utility from the perspective of state interests. Now, the tragedy with this challenge is that it's like pregnancy. You, you just can't be half pregnant. I mean, <laughs> once you get into the business of getting pregnant, you're either there or you're not. And so once Pakistan moves into the business of counterinsurgency, there will come a point where it will have to make a decision to go after all these groups uniformly because the intestinal linkages between these groups will simply not permit Pakistan to successfully pursue a half-hearted counterinsurgency strategy. My own view about the events of the last week is actually much more ambiguous and far more pessimistic because the details that have led up to the apprehension of some of the Afghan Taliban leaders are still not clear. And because of the ambiguity of the circumstances that led up to the apprehensions, I'm not quite ready yet to declare that this represents Exhibit A in Pakistan's turning around with respect to the Afghan Taliban. So let me end by basically making two points. There is no doubt in my mind, first, that Pakistan has come a long way with respect to confronting groups that don't wish it well. But it is equally true in my mind that the biggest challenges for Pakistan in this area still lie ahead of it. The second point that I want to make is that the United States, the international community, and Pakistanis themselves have a vested interest in Pakistan's success. We stand to gain, all of us, individually and collectively, by Pakistan making the right choices with respect to these fundamental issues of its grand strategy. And therefore, it is in our collective interest to help Pakistan along the way as it begins to grapple with these very painful trade-offs that the state will have to confront as it goes after groups that it has nurtured for so long, but which, if it does not confront, will really begin to pose mortal threats to the Pakistan that we wish to see succeed in the years and in the decades ahead. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you very much, Ashley. Uh, before, uh, I think some very good questions have been raised by both Lisa and Ashley. And before I turn the microphone over to Haider for his rebuttal <laughs> um, uh, and, for, and ampli amplifications, uh, uh, let me just say that I, I hear a common thread in both Lisa and Ashley's presentation, and that is uh, whether the uh, switch has been flicked or not, 
in in the policies uh, in Pakistan as to turning to the the enemy within, as we called it several months ago, or or coin. Um, and in in fairness to Hyder, a monograph is not a website. Uh, it takes a long time to prepare and then send to the publisher, uh, and there's a cutoff date. And that cutoff date, I'll uh, hazard, was before these recent arrests. Uh, it, it, it's a, a policy is a continuum, and it doesn't have uh, clear, clear outlines uh, uh, as as clear as we'd like. So I think there is uh, there is a very legitimate question uh, raised by both Ashley and and Lisa that uh, uh, I'd like Heider to address. But he he may have to go outside and beyond his monograph uh, to answer it. Uh, and that is, where are we today? Uh, where is, are we today with Pakistan in the whole holistic approach to the region, the AFPAC? I know everybody hates that uh, acronym. But, but it does try to capture that it, this isn't just about Pakistan. It's not just about Afghanistan. And oh, by the way, it's not just about India. It's about the region. And what is happening uh, with U.S. and NATO forces in Afghanistan does impact on what we're talking about in the book and what is happening in Karachi uh, with some of the rest. And it does impact on what uh, is beginning, as Heider, uh, as, uh, uh, Heider says, perhaps even today already uh, in uh, Mumbai. And if we could look at uh, that in our discussion, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. Heider. Thank you. You know, when I first wrote the monograph, uh, I thought in D.C., uh, you know, it usually has a shelf life of a week, so everybody have, would have forgotten about it, but uh, they have really read it, and, <laughs> <laughs> and nobody paid attention to the distraction, my, uh, my uh, PowerPoint, which <laughs> um, in some ways in the PowerPoint, I do talk about uh, what happened after the, mon you know, after I finished writing the monograph, and uh, and you know, eventually, uh, I, I'd like to hear about you know the comments about how Pakistan plans to stabilize these areas. Because in many ways, if you st if they succeed in these, it does come back to the main point that both Lisa and Ashley uh, made very important point. I, I, I want to start by uh, prefacing my comments by saying that I'm uh, cautiously optimistic, but I am certainly optimistic. Things that I saw uh, during my field research and talking to commanders on the ground, U.S. and Pakistani and intelligence of, uh, officials, think tankers, um, academics, and traveling in the region. Uh, and for a long time, I have uh, been very pessimistic. Uh, uh, and the, the turnaround that I was able to pick up in 2009, uh, you know, I, I had to take it with a grain of salt, but it was very, very difficult for me, and I was, I was skeptical just like you. Uh, and I still am about certain aspects, but I cannot um, sit here and pretend uh, that it did not happen, that Pakistan was not able to put another terrorist slash insurgent group on the list that it wanted to go after. And I can also not pretend that South Waziristan uh, was not important for NATO forces next door, or that Afghan Taliban and, and Pakistani Taliban are not joined uh, at the hip. Uh, there's significant. You have numbers coming out in 2005, 2006, where uh, field commanders in NATO said right after the peace deal, Pakistani peace deal, uh, cross borders at uh, attacks increased 300 percent. Well, they've decreased 300 percent in 2009. And I cannot deny all those things, uh, even while I, I remain very skeptical. Um, what Ashley has talked about, I think, really, uh, even if I use the term uh, paradigm shift, I, I completely understand. This, this takes a very, very long time. Uh, and our hope is obviously that if, some, if a country like Pakistan with that history predisposition uh, is willing to change and is putting more bad guys on the list that we consider bad guys, that India considers, that, that Iran considers, that China considers, that Pakistan itself considers. Uh, and it, you know, uh, like Lisa said, so many Pakistanis have died. Uh, and it is a wake-up call when four brigadier generals are dead. When SSG commandos, Pakistani special forces, are beheaded in downtown uh, Mangora, that's big. Those are wake-up calls. Are they, are they strong enough wake-up calls that will change 
the, pa uh, the paradigm, uh, the jury's out there, I agree. But this is a different kind of world. It's a different kind of Pakistan with the media, with a very activist uh, judiciary, with a government realizing that they need to do something different. You wake up one day and, and everybody's screaming that Taliban is 60 miles away from the capital. That's not how you want to live if you are a nuclear state that hopes to, in the next five years, sign a similar uh, nuclear deal like the Indians did with the Americans, that hopes to move away from this in some way. Now, does that mean, that should certainly mean for us to keep pushing for uh, more investment in its education and, and economy, and really, stay, after it stabilizes the areas, build these areas so these things don't come back. And like I said, governance, administration, development, judicial reforms, all of them are key. And uh, some of them are on the table and some of them are not. But the last 12 months have certainly been more different than, than anything that I have observed in, uh, in that country. Uh, and my hope is that we have enough pressure uh, and leverage to continue this process as we go into the, um, the Taliban reintegration plan. If the Pakistanis want to come on board, they have to come on board, not the way they did after the Soviets were leaving. That's not the kind of Afghanistan we should leave behind. Uh, at the same time, we have to realize we cannot just kick them out or expect them not to have an insurance policy. So, and I think Indians understand that too, because eventually uh, countries in the region would like to grow uh, economically, and, and for that you need investment. Investors don't come in these kind of countries. Uh, and so, so I am guardedly optimistic, and, and I realize, now going forward, as, as Ambassador Chamberlain said, um, I, I agree, it's too early to say those six commanders were, were uh, you know, for Hassan Abbas, for example, has said that the, the arrest was staged. I don't go that far. I think that the arrest was, uh, I mean, my sources on the intelligence sides both have said that this is remarkable, the Barathe was uh, very, very important, and that this could indicate a shift. Now we have to see that, uh, like how many of these commanders, what kind of uh, clout they have in Afghanistan, and then finally, uh, uh, actions speak louder than words. So if we get these guys, and then we actually see differences in Nuristan, Kunar, Helmand, where uh, uh, you actually see the Americans doing pretty much what the Pakistanis did in 2009. They need to gain the initiative, so by the end of this year, I hope there is a hammer and anvil uh, situation, and these, uh, the, both Talibans are squeezed together. And in the end, uh, while they do this, and they realize they can do this, uh, and they don't want to open multiple fronts, in fact, if, if I was a Taliban advisor, I would be begging Lashkar-e Taiba to have another Mumbai. I would be begging them to open up a front in southern Punjab, because that's what you do if you're... And they have plans, and they have allies. They have all allies in Balochistan. So hope is, after they, they do this well, we continue to pressure them, uh, a good carrot stick approach. By the end of this year, hopefully they move towards the other guys. Lashkar-e Taiba, Jashim Muhammad, Sipe Sahaba, a lot of uh, sectarian groups. I, I see from looking around the audience that we have uh, many experts out there. We'll open it up for your questions now because we're running out of time. But uh, you have a lot to say uh, uh, yourselves, so please don't. Please ask a question <laughs> uh, for, for the panel here. Uh, rather than making statements, we, we'd like to uh, entertain some questions. Um, if you could also identify yourself uh, before you ask the question. Thank you. Um, good morning. My name is Sarah. I'm with New Delhi Television. My question's for all the panelists. I just want to ask you what you expect or what one should expect from uh, the Indo-Pak Foreign Secretary level talks taking place in India tomorrow and what this means for the U.S. strategy in Afghanistan and Pakistan. Thank you. Uh, yeah. yeah, I think I'll, uh, Ashley, obviously we'll have much more in the grand strategy. I I'll stick with the, the security situation uh, in India, Pakistan, security situation in Afghanistan, which is going to be very, very important. Obviously, there are other issues, the water issue, uh, uh, economic trade. I think the realization on both sides is that um, some kind of uh, uh, influence sharing has to occur. The Americans are, have made it very clear they're going to leave. Uh, this money flow is not going to stay forever. And um, for the Pakistani perspective, the Indians can't keep building new parliament buildings and new roads. Uh, and, and, and from the Indian perspective, Pakistanis cannot just continue doing uh, business as usual. So what's the middle path? And I think that's what they're going to initiate. Uh, there are nuances there, complexities. Pakistanis would like it to be more 
uh, a broader strategic dialogue. Um, and But I think as of now, it seems like both sides uh, privately will probably put Kashmir in the back burner and focus on uh, the clear and present danger to India uh, for groups like lashkar e um, but not uh, the way they were in the past. I think there will be fewer preconditions for talking. And I think that for the Islamabad interpretation is that uh, that after we were able to prove our counterinsurgency credentials in 2009, uh, Washington was able to put positive pressure, and po and that has led to this. And that's the 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 uh, Pakistani perspective on that. Ashley, would you like to? Well, I just make a quick point that anything that leads up to the normalization of India-Pakistan relations is of great help to our efforts in Afghanistan. And so, from a U.S. perspective, there is no question that this is a very welcome development. And the U.S. has publicly said on the record that they will support this effort, sustain, sustaining it in every way we can. Let me take three questions at a time now. Uh, the, the red hair, the second red hair, <laughs> uh, and the fellow in the back. Hi, my name is Molly Kinder. I'm the first redhead from across the street at the <laughs> Center for Global Development. And my question for both Haider and for Ashley is about the role and the objective of U.S. development assistance in this counterinsurgency strategy. And my sense is that the U.S. has both an interest in reducing the unpopularity of the United States and Pakistan. So, for instance, the hearts and minds of the aid for the U.S., but also in a stable Pakistan, which might mean bolstering the capability of the Pakistan government to do the hold and build. So my question for Haider is you mentioned um, the notion of visibility and branding of U.S. aid. So should the, should the objective of the U.S. assistance to be to be very highly visible U.S. assistance to win hearts and minds for us? Or should we really focusing on using our assistance to bolster the capability of the provincial level to do the hold and build. Thank you. Thanks. I'm Lynn Carter. I'm with Management Systems International. Haider, I'd like to ask a question related to your understanding of current Army thinking about the FCR in the tribal agencies. There have been very modest reforms to that. Uh, political agents were weakened under Musharraf. They're building them back up again. Moderate tribal leaders have been killed in significant numbers by the Taliban and moderate religious leaders as well. It looks rather like a governance vacuum and you can't hold without a decent system of governance. So what are perspectives on the FCR? Uh, morning, uh, Rajak uh, Gundu from SOS International. Uh, two parts to my question. The first one is to what extent uh, would you say that uh, if uh, India and Pakistan were to make progress uh, on uh, Kashmir, uh, Pakistan uh, would drop, uh, say, the uh, support to insurgent groups, uh, given that you know we've seen recent statements just after the Foreign Secretary level talks were announced, Hafiz Saeed now started talking not about just about Kashmir, but also started talking about river water issues and so on. So uh, secondly, to what extent is Pakistani uh, counterinsurgency strategy influenced by uh, fears about a Pashtun revival uh, across uh, the tribal belt and southern Afghanistan. Uh, first question about U.S. development, and should it be uh, visible or should it just focus on um, the old strategy, which is you uh, strengthen uh, local governance, administration, um, and uh, is not very visible. I think more than visible, it has to be transparent. Uh, there are just too many trans uh, conspiracy theories that, that have really become the truth. Uh, in fact, for too many people for too long. And like I said, in the beginning, it worked. Uh, you know, this kind of help where uh, the idea, you know, in theory, works. We give money to a host country, you know, build the host country's government. Everybody likes it, and you kind of are, are in the background. Um, but it all backfired because the, the host the government is very weak and that U.S. aid workers are more insecure, not less. So something new has to happen. So I think transparency is extremely important. And uh, to be fair to Washington, uh, I think Secretary uh, Clinton has worked uh, in the last three months very diligently on doing just that. I, when I was there, she um, announced the 33 million public diplomacy uh, budget for uh, the U.S. Embassy. Um, the two major uh, projects that have been launched in South Waziristan and SWAT in uh, stabilization efforts clearly state that we want it to be visible, we want to focus on things that people really want, electricity grids, water 
things like that. And eventually that word comes out. So, I mean, that word should not be blocked, uh, even though it could be very, very radioactive. But a kind of a slow roadmap towards making the relationship transparent, uh, obviously selling that relationship to the people. So we could have a, a longer relationship that is not hostage to one government, one political party, and frankly, just one strategic uh, objective. It, it, this is a country that uh, we will need help from for a long, long time. So th that long time kind of thinking. Second question about the frontier crime regulation. I, I completely agree. It is in the back burner. It will remain that way uh, f uh, for at least the next uh, a year. And the reason is because uh, before the turnaround in 2009, the idea was we're going to go in and somehow overnight try to uh, resurrect the 700 uh, tribal maliks that were killed. And we would go back in time and have the, the kind, you know, business as usual. And that backfired. None of that is happening. So even the political agents that you talk about, only recently have some of them been able to gain enough uh, power. And that's because they had uh, Pakistani troops surrounding them and helping them implement. Uh, so the idea is, I, I, I think when Pakistan's People's Party government came, they said, we, you know, the prime minister announced, I'm going to get rid of this FCR. If you're a Pakistani in FATA and you have a passport, a Pakistani passport, and I, somebody who grew up uh, in Islam, but have that, we are exactly the same. There is one constitution, one law. And uh, that, was, that was great. That was, you know, a utopian idea. It never could be implemented. And now I think going forward 2011, the plan is to find some kind of a, a compromise. But I think it's extremely important because eventually, as you see these uh, Pakistani provincial and district reconstruction teams slowly giving up, as you know, because in the next 12 to 18 months, there's a, gr um, a plan to train the police. There's a plan to uh, educate some of the mayors, deputy mayors, uh, in these uh, districts and agencies that will eventually take over. And they need to know what kind of framework they're working on, and, and it's very, very important. Last, Hafiz Saeed, and um, as I understand your question, uh, why hasn't Pakistan gone after uh, groups like that enough? Uh, and if it did, uh, it... Yes. And that's why I keep saying we, we look at these groups and we never study their strategy. Mm -hmm. Again, we think of them as these crazies in the corner, reactionary tactics and one bomb blast and they'll run away. These guys are very smart, Hafizi being and Lakshri Taiba. And Lakshri Taiba itself is not uh, monolithic. They're different organizations under a different wings and different uh, things that are working. And you know, earlier on, I think in, by, by 2003, uh, it is fair to say that cross-border infiltration uh, decreased dramatically, and it has remained that way for most of the time. So that means basically Kashmir is not as important as it was, or in fact, the Kashmir policy of, you know, fomenting insurgency was certainly phased out. And you, you see about 10, 20 percent support going in, but nothing beyond that, and I don't, I don't see anything changing in that. Lashir Taiba and, and Joshim Muhammad groups like that are very smart. They have to reorient themselves. They have to sell their message again. They have massive information campaigns, and they finally have to find a new vi venue. And they started doing that before 2000. See, obviously, Joshim Muhammad and the, the attack in Delhi. And then you see Mumbai. So they certainly want to kind of evolve. They compete with Al Qaeda. In fact, they have become more and more audacious over time. And they have bigger goals, regional. And I, I don't. I suspect if they stay the way they are, you you will soon uh, hear from them about their international goals, which will directly hurt U.S. interests. So uh, yes, uh, Pakistan eventually needs to focus on Lashkar -e Taiba because it's very important. And if it does, uh, obviously, that in tandem with better ties with Delhi means that more troops can be freed from that area and kind of moved on the, on the western border. If I could just jump in, I think this is a key question because if in fact this is what Hafiz Muhammad Saeed is saying, then it, it sort of demonstrates that Kashmir in a way is a, a red herring. Um, a lot of people um, you know, are starting to think that, oh, if we could just resolve this you know, 63-year-old dispute over Kashmir, the U.S. could come in, wave its magic wand somehow, um, then we could stabilize Afghanistan and everything would be fine. But I think, you know, what the, the question gets at is if these groups really are just a tool to put pressure on a, uh, a larger military power, um, then 
you know, cashmere really does become a red herring. But that said, um, I do think that, you know, these talks certainly show a reduction in the tensions in the region. I don't have any high hopes there'll be any immediate breakthroughs. And we also have to remember these are foreign secretary level talks. This is not an official resumption of the composite dialogue. Um, so, you know, we have to keep our, our expectations in check somewhat. But I think it is significant that the Indian Home Minister has indicated that even though uh, Kashmir is not on the table in, in the larger composite dialogue sense, that India may be willing to talk about issues like opening up uh, transport and trade routes along the line of control that divides India and Pakistan and Kashmir. So I think, you know, the idea is getting back to those talks between former President Musharraf and Prime Minister Singh, where the two started to make statements that um, characterize the dispute in different ways, talking about making the line of control irrelevant, talking about having more interaction between Pakistani Kashmir and Indian Kashmir. Um, so I think there is scope for forward movement uh, in these areas, and that it is encouraging that the Indian Home Minister even mentioned that you could talk about issues relating to tr transport and trade, um, these types of issues. I just want to say a few words on the question about development assistance and what the goals are. In addition to everything that Haider said, which I agree with, I would add one more uh, objective as our aid has to be effective. And this raises very important questions about the means of delivery and whether we actually have the instruments to deliver that aid, first at lowest cost to ourselves, but also in a way that does most good uh, for the recipients of this assistance. The question of what the objectives of aid are really depends on where the aid is going. And I would argue that aid that is going to Afghanistan and aid that is going to the FATA has the very clear objective of supporting a counterinsurgency strategy. That is, we want to make certain that once we do the clearing, you actually have the resources necessary to help people support legitimate government. But there is another objective, and this is particularly true outside Afghanistan and the FATA, and that is assisting Pakistan to stabilize as a state. And this is in enhancing Pakistan's economic capability, building its capacities with respect to accumulating human capital, and ultimately, from a U.S. point of view, showing that we can be steadfast partners of Pakistan over the long term. And certainly when it comes to assisting the provinces, these goals are extremely important, and I would say just as important as the support to counterinsurgency would be in Afghanistan and the Fatah. We, we are over time, so I will not add my thoughts on assistance to Pakistan. Um, but I will direct you to the MEI uh, website where I've just uh, produced a, a commentary on it, uh, if you're at all interested. I uh, want to thank uh, our panelists enormously for, I think, a very uh, um, uh, insightful discussion today, and to thank uh, all of you for your very good questions and your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you.